brilliant for all of us. Um, my name is Mike, uh, and this is my incredibly uh, long titled, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's not very good, it's very search engine optimized title. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about something a bit weird. Um, I know it's a level design track. I'm going to be talking about dialogue systems. Um, but I, I hope that it's kind of an interesting take um, on dialogue systems using level design lenses. Maybe there's some stuff in here as well that might help with communication with writers or taking your level design skill set and applying it in different places in the game. It's an interesting case study, hopefully. So obligatory who am I slide. Um, I'm Mike Bithel. I've already, I think I already said that. I might do it a couple more times. Um, I'm an indie developer. Um, if, you, if you've heard of me, it's probably because of um, Thomas Was Alone, which is a pretentious rectangle platforming game. Overrated, in my opinion, um, but fa thankfully I don't write the reviews. Um, Volume was the follow-up, which was a stealth game, uh, and then Subsurface Circular is the one that just came out. Out of interest in the room, anyone in there actually played Subsurface Circular? Oh, cool, a couple of you, awesome, excellent, okay. Uh, if you could just like explain to the people around you what the hell it is throughout the talk course of the talk, that'd be great. Um, but, you know, even though I'm known for these games, um, I am um, a level designer. That's, that's kind of my background, that's, that's where I'm from. Um, I worked as a level designer uh, on a bunch of games, uh, 3D platformers, 2D brawlers, I worked as a graphic designer, a concept designer. I've done most jobs at some point. Um, if there was someone who was willing to pay my bills, I'd make a video game for them. Um, I uh, did the full level design on Thomas Was Alone. I oversaw the level design on Volume. I had a really talented team of guys on that. Um, and then Subsurface Circular, which is the game we're going to be talking about today, I was the sole level designer on, uh, which was kind of cool, uh, but also practical because it's a very small game. So the game Subsurface Circular. Um, uh, this game, it exists because we had a gap. Um, the polite, politically good version of this is we found ourselves with an exciting uh, six-month gap in our schedule, thanks to our colleagues in the publishing world. Um, <laughs> that's one way of putting it. Um, and we had this, we had this gap, and we, we had to use it for something. Uh, so R&D made sense uh, as something to do. I've just realized, by the way, I didn't tell any of you to turn off your phones, to fill in your evaluation forms, or to sit in the middle of the room, which is a thing, apparently. I don't know if that's to make it look like there's more of you in the audience, don't know, but it's there. Um, let's move along. Um, so yeah, it was a way of, it was a bit of time we had and we wanted to do some R&D. There was uh, a real problem that I saw in our games, which was that they were very story-led, that we're known for being story-led, that people liked the characters and the worlds we built, but the story was just kind of something that happened to you while you played the game. You know, you did a platformer, or you did a bit of stealth exploration, and Andy Serkis told you story over the VO. And that, I figured that would work for maybe two games, maybe three games, and then people were gonna realize I'm kind of a hack, and I kind of wanted to move beyond that and do something more interactive and more interesting. Um, the trick, of course, would be to keep it small. We had, well, we've wasted a month just thinking of all the stuff I just said, so we're now down to about five months, um, and we need to make something that can be made in that time with the money we have, which isn't an infinite resource. We have like quite a small budget we can put into this. I managed to convince the people I work with to go for this, uh, so we have to get this game made. We decide on Subsurface Circular, which we stealth launched. Um, it's a narrative game, it's a text adventure game about a detective who's a robot. And I'm not gonna tell you anything else, I'm gonna show you the trailer, because we literally stealth launched it, so the audience didn't know anything more about this game than the trailer, so this is a good way of introducing it. I might talk a little bit while it's going on, but please pay attention to how the gameplay works. It's kind of a dialogue system, that's what we're gonna be talking about throughout the whole of this talk, so uh, keep an eye on that. But let me play this trailer for you quickly.
the game. Uh, with amazing base, apparently. That was a great experience. Um, so you didn't see any level design there. We're off to a great start. Um, so first of all, you know, please do bear with me. Uh, we'll get to it, I promise. The key thing here is that I have used some level design approaches uh, in the way that we've approached dialogue systems. So we've got a lot of things that you saw kind of being played with there. The core gameplay is built around these lists of options that come up, your standard kind of everything from Mass Effect to Horizon to any kind of Western RPG you've played, dialogue options you can throw into conversation in order to move things forward, to make choices. Um, we, uh, we design dialogue um, around uh, linear paths, so that standard thing of branching you off, giving you some options, coming back to a hub that you've seen in a lot of games where you'll kind of be able to investigate a subject or whatever. We tried not to do that though because we had something that was far more interesting and actually opened up our opportunity to do level design, which was these focus points. So in the bottom there you can see I've actually unlocked one on that screenshot and I've got a bank of them in an inventory down here. Focus points are topics or subjects that you can interject into conversation um, either to answer a question, to ask a question. You can use uh, themes and subjects you've picked up on uh, to have a conversation. You can carry them with you, you can lose them, you can gain them. And once we added that to the game, we had something interesting going on. But we had a problem. We want to make a two-hour dialogue tree game. And you just saw it. It's pretty straightforward. You know, it's mainly just clicking on these options. And we knew we didn't have an art budget, we didn't have much time or money, and we knew that the writing would hopefully be quite good because that's something that we're known for, um, but we also were a little bit worried that it would be boring. There would be something that didn't really attach with an audience that would be kind of just a long slog. Um, there was a real concern there. Um, and how did we fix that using existing skills? Because it kind of relied on the skills we already had on the team uh, to actually solve that problem. We, like I said, we couldn't spend much money. We couldn't bring in too many other people. And finally, with interactive fiction, there's a niche audience. There's a specific audience who plays a lot of interactive fiction, who have a good time with those games. But we wanted to reach beyond that. Our previous games had found kind of not mainstream audiences, but broader audiences. So we knew it was important that we went back to those players and gave them something that they would hopefully enjoy and that they wouldn't be put off by because they'd not played a game like this before. What would we do? Well, we came to a solution. This isn't my level design. This is from Half-Life. It's very good. Um, it just looks cool. Um, <laughs> it's a great level as well. Um, I realized I was a level designer, so I realized that actually there were these kind of skills that I already had in me. Um, this is a key turning point in the movie adaptation of this uh, slideshow that we'll be using. Um, I realized the power was within me all along. Um, <laughs> slightly arrogant thing to say in front of a room full of people. Um, I realized that actually a lot of the kind of the instincts I had as a level designer would apply to storytelling. Um, I realized, first of all, that I, if I came up with a story that explained why the protagonist was asking a lot of questions, um, I'd be onto something. Detective fiction immediately jumped out. And there's a reason that so much detective fiction is about world building. Your protagonist is looking for answers, looking for information. There's very few professions where you can walk into a room and just start asking people how their day's going and not get kicked out. Detectives are a great way of doing that. Um, realizing that kind of thing would help, realizing I could have puzzles and challenges as a result of that, immediately I started seeing gameplay rather than just a chat in a video game. And I realized that there were so many links between good writing and good design, causality, uh, predictability of outcomes, goal setting, the kind of things that make good levels, that make us feel as players that a game is treating us fairly, are also sort of rules of writing. They're in all the writing books as well. There's a lot of storytelling level design overlap. Um, and this was an, I'm gonna actually hold on this slide while you take a photo. You got it? Awesome. Uh, let's carry on. <laughs> if I have to rush later because of you, I'm gonna hold you responsible. Um, so that's all very nice. That's a nice thing to say and to kind of point out, but, but how do we actually practically do that? How do we apply level design to conversation? Well, first of all is those focus points, which remain the coolest idea that we came up with for the game. Focus points are an inventory. They're an object you can collect. And with that single choice, suddenly you have level design. You can collect them. 
You can lose them. And that can be jarring. That can be kind of a moment of fear of what of you've, you've had some stuff and then the game's taken it away. That's something to use very carefully. You can combine them in that classic adventure game sense where you take object A and object B, put them together and get something else. That feels like deduction. That feels like working something out. That's a cool thing that a detective would do and can give us some gameplay opportunities. You can open conversation doors with them. We, you, we do this a lot in Subsurface, arguably a little bit too much. But the idea of you know a character who needs direction to a specific building, you can go, and go get that information, bring it back, and give it, that's a door. That's a key and a door. That, the information is the key, the person who needs it is a door. Suddenly you've got quest design, you can do stuff with that. And of course we can do exploration and world building. We can, we can have focus points that unlock interesting doors over here to a bit of exposition. We can have focus points that are in themselves a rewarding uh, outcome of exploration that you can kind of find a weird conversation track and get some value from that. Again, all level design stuff, all stuff that you would use and think about if you were build, trying to build compelling levels. But there's more. Objectives. Uh, as I said, we've got quest giving. That's easy. We can also do aesthetic objectives. So we can say, hey, you should go over, the, or it would be cool if you worked out this, and then 10 minutes later just give you a, a click on that objective saying you worked out this. Uh, no game design involved there, but it feels nice. Uh, we can also do cleverer stuff where we're actually tracking your actions and, and how many interactions you've had, that kind of thing, locking in you know, your progress towards a task, which again, it builds up that sense of progress, so pro, sorry, progression and, and level. Multiple characters, you saw there two characters just talking in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's how subsurface is. But because every train carriage has multiple characters in it, you're constantly moving between different one-on-one -on -one conversations, which become rooms and become separate spaces that give the player a sense of traversal. Because you might be talking to this character, and then you might realize you need to go over there to talk to that character, and then you come back with that information to that character. Players talk about this in verbs like go over there, come back. They are a robot sat on a train. There is no movement or traversal taking place. But by having just different characters you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with, we create the sense of traversal, of movement. And that's incredibly powerful and useful. Signposting we didn't really do. Um, our dialogue flows in a way that kind of makes it hard for it to, you to get lost as a player. But we did, again, find an opportunity there to use that in storytelling. We have a literal Chekhov's gun in the game, uh, a gun that is introduced at the start. And if, in a good story, if you introduce a gun in the first scene, you need to make sure someone's shot it by the end. We absolutely hold true to that, that, that storytelling analogy. Um, and we also allow for experimental play. Um, we have characters in the world who serve no story purpose whatsoever, but that you can have fun conversations with. My favorite is the robot who's into Hamilton, um, and you can kind of sing songs with. That's quite fun. He's going to Hamilton, but you want him to be. Uh, so you sing at him, and he ignores you. And it's a great moment, which has absolutely no bearing on the game's story whatsoever, but it's still something that I guess sent screenshots of almost every day, because people find it and enjoy it. And again, that's the sort of stuff that regular dialogue systems don't do because they're not thinking it through as a level design. And that's exciting to me. Moo, you're gonna recognize this slide. Um, applying level design to conversation. So technically, uh, what are some, some interesting parts of that, that process? Well, first of all, making the full cast robotic was super useful. Realizing that we could kind of cover up any flaws in our writing by having characters who are robots was so useful. Characters uh, can talk a bit stilted, they can have sudden emotional shifts. We don't have too much of that in subsurface, except for one big puzzle, which I'm gonna talk about in, ooh, in a minute. Um, but anywhere where our robots behave in a non-human-like way, we have a canonical reason why that's the case. It's super useful, and there's no shame in having those kind of narrative and world-based excuses for the shortcomings of the, of the experience you're creating. Um, and of course, crucially, we have this, and I didn't know you were uh, gonna be in the audience, Moo, this is embarrassing, but I do name drop you here, hey Moo. Um, very talented coder who came in and built this really nice, fast node-based system. So this is how we build a level for Subsurface Circular, is with these really cool, uh, very, very zoomed out dialogue node systems. Um, way more visibility than, than the tools most people use for this kind of work. Um, we have a lot less features than they do, but we basically stripped out or just didn't bother to put in in the first place features that weren't useful in getting us writing quickly. So let's talk about that process. How do you do this? How do you design dialogue in this way? Well, first of all, you do what a writer does. 
you pull out some post-it notes or a record board and you work out your act structure and all of that kind of story stuff uh, that you do for any kind of writing, where you work out the big beats of the narrative, how that game world is gonna flow. But ultimately, you're not thinking about interaction, you're thinking about story progression. The next step is where you come into the interactive uh, points. So we would go to a flow chart. That flow chart then ends up similar to this on the right here. It's kind of cropped off, but you can see uh, blue is uh, focus points, red is objectives, and you can see there that we're kind of thinking through the process of different conversations. Each conversation is numbered. That's how I'm breaking it up and thinking it through. But this is the trajectory in just one level, how we're moving between different characters and talking to them about different subjects. It's all very structured. Um, it needed to be because we have so much writing on the next step. So the next step was an initial draft of the script. So we'd write it like a movie. So just a very linear, two characters get talking. Super useful, we can work out tone, voice, characterization, we can do all of the, the good writer stuff where you, where you really arrive at a character that the audience is gonna care about uh, without having to worry too much about the logic and the game designy bits, which we then did next in the node editor where we would then copy and paste that linear draft in, and you remember from the previous slide, the branching, I would then add all of that branching and add all that variety to it. It's interesting in kind of future experiments we're taking with this tech, we actually cut out the linear script stage altogether because I actually think that uh, forces me or, or pushes me towards writing very linearly when I should be thinking in that branching way from day one. Um, that was a confidence thing and kind of a learning process for me. So the, uh, the initial draft step is now not how we do this. Which makes it harder, but the, it comes out better. Um, the other thing to point out that's really interesting from a level design point of view, there's no blocking stage involved in anything I just described. Um, it's you just write, um, and you've got logical gameplay from day one. There's no white boxing because there's no art pass. Um, it's just writing, so you're just trying to, you're redrafting essentially in the same way as you would with any kind of piece of writing, 10, maybe 15 times, but you're just working into the same script, which means it's fast and it means there's no dependencies. Our art in the game, you saw in the trailer, we got really nice art, but it's kind of devoid in our production pipeline from the level design. It's something that kind of exists separately and that's really useful, that means we don't, we're not held up by it, they're not held up by us, we can just kind of, I can just be writing essentially from day one and I'm producing work that goes into the final game. I wanted to give a quick example of how this works. Uh, so sequence five, spoilers, um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> sequence five uh, is uh, the most popular level in the game. I think it's a useful one to use to kind of showcase how this thinking works. It's very hard when you're just looking at the stream of text to, to see what the level design is. So I did this quick little diagram. I literally did it yesterday, because um, I didn't like this slide, and the last diagram was bad. Uh, so the sequence starts uh, with you entering the room at the top there by that red key. You have a very simple conversation with a side character. The red key uh, represents a specific piece of information about the situation that's going on in the game. I'm gonna try and keep it spoiler free. Um, you then have two other characters get into the train carriage, those, those, uh, those two rooms underneath the room with the key in. Uh, those two characters you have a bit of flavor time with, you can kind of lie to them, you can be honest. It doesn't really have a massive impact on the story kind of going forward from that point, but it's there and it's a nice bit of kind of framing for what's about to come next. Then we get into the meat and potatoes of this, uh, which is those two characters are emotionally linked. So making one of those characters happy or sad or angry also makes the other character happy or sad or angry, which opens up different conversational paths with that second character. And as I put it up there, and because everyone always reads the bullet point the second it goes up on the screen, you're ahead of me, which is, that's every 90s FPS water level raising and lowering puzzle. Um, that was a really great opportunity to use something very specific from these old games I liked um, in a dialogue situation and make it feel fresh. So you're manipulating the emotions, that's opening doors, you can see on the right kind of a, kind of a clumsy depiction of that of different rooms with different keys in, you're kind of finding new focus points and new information by going down different channels. And then right at the end, that long one pointing off to the right there, you use that little piece of information you learn from the first side character right at the start of the scene, which feels very detective-y to kind of remember that there was a brick by the entrance as you came in and that's, that breaks the case 
and you realize what's going on, that unlocks the end of the level, which you then move into. So it's a progression through a dungeon, but it's also good detective fiction writing, hopefully. Um, it's, it's all of that logic I'm talking about, all of those shared principles in the worlds of writing good genre fiction and hopefully designing good levels tied together. And then you die. Um, right. Um, spoilers. Um, you don't die. You sort of die. So where did it not fit? Because this, this is sounding very clever so far. It's got to have gone wrong some ways, right? And it absolutely did. Um, first of all, conversation flows. Um, making a cul-de-sac or a blockage or a wall or a dead end in a conversation doesn't really work for us. Or it, we, had, we had trouble with it. It didn't feel fun. It didn't feel rewarding. It felt like the game had broken. You know, you didn't want to hear the same line of dialogue repeating over and over again because the character wouldn't let you past. That means that the game is a bit more on rails uh, than you would normally do with a traditional level design. It feels a little bit more structured. It's forcing you in the right direction at all times. That's a limitation of this model. Similarly, as a result of that, um, I relied a little bit too much on arbitrary puzzles. Anyone who's played the game through, you're gonna know immediately what I'm talking about. There's a couple of puzzles in there that are riddles where you'll be on a really interesting detective case and then a character will go, well, there are two knights and one of them can only tell the truth and one of them can only lie. It's not that one, but it's, it's that kind of stuff and it trips people up and it irritates people and I'm forever reading forum posts about how awful that particular puzzle is. And they're right, they're all absolutely right. Um, it's a limitation because um, making something as linear as we did, the detective metaphor sometimes didn't work in every situation and that definitely kind of locked us into some different paths. And finally, because, speaking of different paths, because we were focusing so much on making good gameplay and good design that felt good to work through, we did let down the audience on a genre expectation, which is branching narratives. A lot of interactive fiction, you can be kind of, you can choose different paths, you can choose different actions, which take you in different directions. Our game's actually pretty linear. You know, the story doesn't, there are different endings, but it's all very, very straightforward because we were focusing on making the, the design and the dungeons fun. Because dungeons tend to only have one exit. Um, so we kind of, that was another limitation of the design approach that kind of wasn't, wasn't terrible, but it was definitely something that kind of uh, disappointed people about the game. Um, and also, it's worth pointing out in any talk uh, how specific this is. Um, this worked because um, <laughs> we, uh, we're text-based, uh, so we, we lean very heavily on the ambiguities of the written word. We uh, absolutely don't have to record VO. We, uh, that would have been a nightmare. Um, and to get all the different VO in that would track different choices you've made and still sound appropriate would have been terrible. Um, we lean very heavily on the limitations of our presentation. Um, there's lots of reasons this wouldn't necessarily work in everything. This is the boring slide, reception, it reviewed really well. A couple of people thought that there was no game design. Right, um, it's not a very interesting slide. Um, but yeah, it, it went down really well. It was, it was well received, which is great. Um, so where can we take this next? We're, we've said publicly we're playing with this idea because it, it did resonate and we think there's more opportunities there. So a few of those ideas. Multiple characters in conversation at once. Our game is about one-on-one -on -one conversation, subsurface circular. What happens if that's a, a kind of an Aaron Sorkin style, five people in a corridor talking over each other? Is that really annoying to the player? Or does that feel kinetic and energetic? And can we, can we play with those, blur those lines of like where, where, where conversation ends with one character and starts with another? That could be interesting. Pairing decision making with more audiovisual output. As I said, we kept the art and the design kind of separate throughout the process. Can we do more? Can we have music that reacts to what you're doing? Can we have visuals that react to what you're doing? Can we get more animation in there? There's lots of interesting places we can hook stuff audiovisually onto these outcomes. Visualization narrative space. Making that diagram, I realized how interesting it might be to a player to have that kind of awareness of the conversation they're having. It's an interesting one to play with because it might be that that's too much information and it actually makes the game feel kind of arbitrary or overly mechanical. But there's also a possibility that tracking that information, giving it to the player and saying to the player, this is how you're moving through this dialogue possibility space, even if we show it to them after they've completed the level, say, could be interesting. That one's weird, I don't know. We'll, we'll get to that maybe sometime. 
and allowing for more traditional branching around puzzles, making it that we actually give the IF players what they want and let them have big story outcomes of their actions. That's really just down to focus and time on my part, writing more stuff, um, not coming to GDC, and just staying in my room writing stuff. Uh, and uh, then finally, of course, because this is a, a GDC talk, um, procedural generation, randomization, spawning. We had some randomization that was really interesting. Um, uh, I think the only thing that survived into subsurface is that the listener characters have different names um, each time you play it. The original version was much more randomized and varied and, as a result, terrible. Um, which is why it went, we went much more linear down the road. But I do think there is stuff. There is, there is quote-unquote filler dialogue. There are conversations that could happen that don't need to be the, the core dialogue of the game. The equivalent of getting, we were talking about extras earlier, the equivalent of getting extras to throw in a line of dialogue to establish a scene. Why couldn't that be handled by something that's just throwing in some random options or built systemically so it's reacting to what the player's doing or what the world's doing? There are, op there are opportunities there which we can explore. And the final slide, so if anyone has any questions, get up. I think I'm going to have time for one. Um, potential for level design in other fields. I want, to, I want to broaden this out because I do think there's an opportunity here, I hope, to take level design principles like the ones I've talked about and apply them in other areas of game development because you're probably not all working on dialogue-based, pretentious robot detective novels. Uh, so kind of, we can probably broaden it a bit more. Um, we already see navigation and exploration built into progressive system, uh, into uh, progression systems. I like that in Shadow of War. There's some interesting branching that's starting to go on. Feels like a level, feels like moving through a space, which is interesting. Of course, quest and mission systems, we're already seeing great innovation in, um, in this area. Probably there's room for more. I really don't like, I'm a big AAA fan. That's most of what I play because I spend all day making indie games. I kind of want to relax with a, with a great open world AAA game. And it's weird to me that the map isn't used more, that we don't find more opportunities to do level design and game design at the map screen level, because those games are about these massive worlds. Surely there's some stuff, I keep hitting the mic, sorry. Surely there's some stuff that, we'll kind, that we can kind of do with that, world, that screen as well and kind of either tell interesting stories on that screen or allow progression or movement on that screen that's interesting. And I wanted to point out specifically Horizon. I loved Horizon for a lot of reasons, but I would put the enemy design in, in Horizon up with a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here. Those bosses all feel like levels. They're just levels that happen to be trying to kill me um, over and over again. Um, and, and that's cool. As I'm playing those levels, it's not just finding the sensitive spots. There's a causality and a progression to those attacks, uh, which feels really good as a player. It feels like something I can learn and get better at. Um, and that I can master. And that feels like that's a great opportunity that that game takes advantage of. Cool, I've managed to do this with, I think, two minutes to spare. Is that right? Yes, I'm getting a thumbs up. So probably time for one question. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. One question. Yes, hello. Oh, remember to do your evaluation things as well. Hello. Hey. Um, in the middle of Subsurface Circular, there's one conversation with a character that brings up, it's, it's half joke, half lore, where they start reciting the dialogue from Thomas Was Alone. Yes. Um, where does that, I mean, like, the quickest level design lens is that it's like putting an old version of a game into a new version like Wolfenstein does. How do you think something like that could be built on using the philosophies you just talked about in the last 30 minutes? That's really interesting. Yeah, it's a joke. I mean, that's, that's the main reason it's there. It's kind of, so you, yeah, there's a, in the world, there's a priest, and during the writing process when I was thinking, okay, well, what's this priest? He, uh, do I want to like, give him a specific human religion? It's like, oh, well, Thomas was alone. He's about the emergence of gods. Let's make him a believer in Thomas was alone. And then he recites Thomas was alone to you. If you ask him to, and he will stop if you tell him to, and he'll eventually stop because I got bored of copying and pasting all of the Thomas was alone dialogue. Uh, he, he eventually goes, that's enough. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's an Easter egg right now. It literally is the Wolfenstein thing of just hiding a Wolfenstein level in Wolfenstein. Um, but yeah, I think the idea of returning to stuff, of having impact, using players' knowledge of previous games in that circumstance, having uh, a situation where you have a more meaningful thing. So there's uh, one of the things that's in there for like the hardcore Thomas Was Alone fans is one of the names you can give your character at the start of the game is Claire, who's a very important character to the Thomas Was Alone fan base. 
Um, and if you play as that character as Claire, then there's kind of this soft implication that maybe you're related to that character from Thomas, and that kind of fits and, and tracks narratively. Um, so I think there is that kind of deeper way of doing it. In terms of like level design, that's interesting. There's probably m other more exciting ways of doing that as well. And also bringing data across and having that kind of Mass Effect style game to game continuity would be interesting. Um, I think I'm probably out of time. This says I am. Um, I am, I'm very excited to tell you about in 20 minutes from now, a brilliant talk that I've made a mental note of called uh, An Architectural Approach to Level Design, Creating uh, an Art Theory for Game uh, Worlds. And so can you, I'm pretty sure I read that wrong. Um, but it, genuinely, I was chatting to him last night about it. it's really cool. So do, do stick around and watch that. That'll be really neat. Uh, I think there's a 20 minute break now. If anyone wants to chat, I'm gonna be around here and I'd love to talk to you about video games and stuff. Thanks a lot for your time.